We want to look at Abu Talib, this powerful man in Quraysh whom they feared a lot. He was not a Muslim. He was one of the elite of Quraysh. He had ignorance in him to a very, very high degree. But he was a very polite man and he was very, very disciplined, cultured person. Although when I say ignorance, I mean he had some of his beliefs within him that he just would not give up. So he did not accept the message of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there was a statement Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made more than once. Some narrations say it was mentioned to Abu Talib. And some say not only Abu Talib, but even Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wallahi, if you were to put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, and you were, tell me, you were to tell me to leave what I am doing, what I am calling towards the belief in one Allah, I will not do that. I will not leave it. So Abu Talib told him, okay, proceed and carry on. Don't worry, I will look after you as best as I can. And as for Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, he heard these verses, he went back to Quraysh and I told you what he said. And he also did not accept, which means there were people who knew what was right and wrong, as we mentioned yesterday, that Allah says, قَدْ نَعْلَمُ إِنَّهُ لَيَحْزُنُكَ الَّذِي يَقُولُونَ فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يُكَذِّبُونَكَ وَلَكِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ يَجَحَدُونَ We know that it hurts you what they utter. We want to tell you they do not belie you. They don't deny the message. They are actually, meaning in their hearts they know what is right, but they are disagreeing with you out of arrogance. They just don't want it because they are too proud and haughty. May Allah never make our pride such that we do not come to the true path. Sometimes a person has a level in society or wealth or certain uh, prestige that Allah has given them and because of that, they don't want to come down to what is right. They cannot be told by ulama. They want to make all the decisions and call all the shots because of who they are. They don't want to surrender to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah not make us from amongst those. That was a habit of the mushriks of Mecca. And Allah mentions this, mentions this in the Quran in more than one place. So now Abu Talib was a man who was looking after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because of him, they couldn't touch him. They couldn't touch Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the kuffar got together and they decided let's have another chat with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They spoke to him and said, okay, let's arrive at a compromise. They saw his numbers were growing. No one who accepted his message turned back. But it, there, was, there were people from amongst them whom they were losing to Islam, so to speak. So they said, let's strike this deal, agreement. What's the agreement? One day you worship our gods, one day we worship your god. Deal, one one, Allahu Akbar. This is no football match. Allahu Akbar, Allah protect us, grant us goodness. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately was given verses by Allah. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ Say, O oh disbelievers, I do not worship what you people believe in. And you do not worship what I believe in. And I don't worship what you believe in. And you do not worship what I believe in. For you is your faith. You can carry on doing what you want. And for me is my faith. Let me do what I have to. Allahu Akbar. What a law. What a law. Live and let live. That's the Quran. Lakum deenukum waliyadeen. You have your faith. You can continue. You can go ahead. I have my faith. Subhanallah. Let me carry on. Let me worship Allah. And this is why we have this policy, the live and let live policy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may He give us a deep understanding. So now we know why that surah was revealed because the kuffar of Quraysh wanted one day you worship, one day we worship. We come together. Wallahi in Malawi, and I visited this place a few times, there was a place that was a church where they used to call in the Muslims, have salah in it, and at the same time they would have the church services as well. And they would say, don't worry, we worship Allah as well and you must come and worship here as well. Confusing the masses and the people so that they, their deen is left. Until Allahu Akbar, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. People went out there and tried to explain to the people. Remember, the gift you have of Iman, it is so sweet that we are taught if the kings of the globe who are non-Muslim knew the sweetness we were in, they would fight us in order to get the sweetness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us halawatul iman. The belief in the one maker who has made you, the one whom you are going to return to. 
that belief, the singular belief has so much sweetness in it, it is actually tasted and thereafter there is nothing that one would like to do besides to worship his own maker. Never render an act of worship for anyone or anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had uttered these verses to them. They were quiet once again. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admonishes Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Literally scolds him. And these verses are so powerful. We read them every other day. Our children read them, mashallah. We memorize these verses. What happened? The kuffar of Quraysh had called Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to discuss a matter. And he, whilst he was talking with some of these seniors of uh, Quraysh, Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiallahu an, who was a companion, a sahabi who had accepted Islam, he was blind and he walked past and he being blind wouldn't have known exactly what was going on. He says, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, give me from the goodness, tell me some of the goodness that Allah has given you. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was busy talking to these kuffar. So he looked back and he frowned at him a little bit and carried on speaking with these people thinking that you know these people might listen to what i have to say now and if i'm going to speak to this man right now then perhaps the message might be lost from these people here and immediately jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came down with verses scolding muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam abasa wa tawalla he frowned and turned away when the blind man came to him and how do you know perhaps that blind man would have been purified by your words if you had turned to him and given him a few words or had he been reminded he it may have benefited him the reminder would have benefited the blind man as for those who are not even bothered about you, they are totally independent from you. They haven't asked you. You are telling them. You are concentrating on them so much. Allahu Akbar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, the one who is calling you here, you didn't turn to him. And the one whom nothing is really going to benefit, you are spending your time with them so much at the expense of these. فأنت له تصدى وما عليك ألا يزكى and if they do not cleanse themselves, purify themselves, it's not against you. Yours is the message. Now Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم immediately turned to Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum رضي الله عنه. And even though he is a Sahabi who was blind, he was always smiled to. And after that, he always used to say, Ya Abdullah, you are the one whom Allah has admonished me about. Now one might wonder, the kuffar of Quraysh knew these verses. They knew that Allah admonished Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from this, you would know that these verses cannot be from him because who would want to have a scolding written in verses which they have brought? Allahu Akbar. And then we might ask, if this was a perfect example in the messenger, what benefit is there for me and you to read that he was scolded? Allahu Akbar. The answer is very simple. You see, we have to follow his example in everything. So much so, his example is so complete that for us who think we are so intelligent and so well educated, whenever we are corrected, how do we react to correction? We learn it from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he was corrected, he didn't get angry. He didn't deny. He didn't delete. What he did is he acknowledged immediately. He surrendered. He changed himself. How many of us are ready to change ourselves whenever we are corrected? How many? We feel bad. Sometimes in Salah, the Imam is corrected and he feels so bad. He stops talking to the man who corrected him. It happens. And sometimes what happens in society and community, someone comes to us, uncle, please don't do this. Or they come to an aunt and say, you know what, my sister, this is wrong. And we say, who are you? Who are you to tell me? Allahu Akbar. If you follow the perfect example, in that perfect example, part of its perfection is to have in it how to react when you are corrected, no matter how perfect you think you are. None of us are perfect, subhanAllah. So this is the beautiful verse. And these are the beautiful verses of Surah Abbas. And we know now when we read Abbas wa Tawalla, we will think of that blind man whom Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was admonished about. Now the kuffar of Quraysh, they came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, okay, we're ready to accept your message on condition that you bring for us a sign. 
we want several signs from you. In fact, first they asked for one. What was the sign? They said something impossible. We want you to split the moon for us. We want you to split the moon. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As they looked, he pointed at the moon, split it into two. The moon was split into two. اقتربت الساعة وانشق القمر وإن يروا آية يعرضوا ويقولوا سحر مستمر الله أكبر The time has come near, the hour has come near, the moon has split asunder, the moon has been made into two parts they saw it and when they saw it and they saw the sign that they had asked for they said this is indeed magic nothing but magic but you asked for the sign here's the sign it has come and now you are telling us that the moon being split is only magic you are conning our eyes we will notice subhanallah that moon came back by the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but to this day there is a crack in the moon a crater in the moon if you take a look at the diagrams and the various photographic evidence there is from the moon, you will find it up to now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors for us. That was a miracle that definitely happened, mentioned in the Quran. And we have scientific evidence to back it up and to prove that it did occur. Subhanallah. The kuffar of Quraysh, they rejected it. They said another sign we want. وَقَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى تَفْجُرَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَنْبُوعًا When they saw that now this one worked and we still don't want to believe, they said, okay, we're not going to believe in you until from the earth you make springs gush wherever we want. أَوْ تَكُونَ لَكَ جَنَّةٌ مِّن نَخِيلٍ وَعِنَبٍ فَتُفَجِّرَ الْأَنْهَارَ خِلَالَهَا تَفْجِيرًا Oh, we want you to see, or we want to see with you gardens of dates and various other fruits and so on. And we want the uh, rivers to flow and to gush out in those gardens. Bring the gardens, let's see what they are. And then those are the signs we want. We want to see you having a house made full of adornments and jewelry and so on. Or we want you to go right up into the heavens whilst we are watching. So you climb up. Let's see what happens. You say you're getting revelation from the heavens. Go up. We want to watch it. And then they say, They knew that that could happen. If Allah wanted it, it can happen. So they said, and even if you climb up, we're not going to believe. Until you come back to us with a book that we can read. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul, tell them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhana rabbi, hal kuntu illa basharan rasoola. Glory be to my Rabb. I am only but a human being as a messenger unto you. Stop asking me all these things. And this was a gift of Allah. Because if Quraysh had been given these miracles, they would have been destroyed. But Allah had written Iman in the hearts of some of them. Or should I say the bulk of them who accepted Iman and Islam later on, a few years down the line, Allah had had mercy on them. So Allah kept them. There were just a handful of them who were destroyed before the victory of Makkah. But the bulk of them, victory of Makkah, they all accepted Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an opening and may He make us from amongst those who surrender. This evening we read a verse and I want to repeat this verse because it is also one of the, the verses that is making mention of what the kuffar of Quraysh had asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see how foolish if a person comes to us and tells us, uh, I am a messenger and so on, if we were there at the time, perhaps we would have said, okay, bring for us some miracle. When the miracle came, we would have asked for something good. You know what they did? The kuffar of Quraysh, they says, وَإِذْ قَالُوا اللَّهُمَّ إِنْ كَانَ هَذَا هُوَ الْحَقَّ مِنْ عِنْدِكْ فَأَمْطِرْ عَلَيْنَا حِجَارَةً مِنَ السَّمَاءِ أَوْ اِئْتِنَا بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ They said, if this is the truth, then O oh Allah, the Allah that is being called upon, send down upon us stones from
from heaven to punish us. Rain stones from heaven so we can be destroyed. Let's see. How foolish. If they said, send us gold, perhaps they would have got gold. Send us some silver, some jewelry, it would have come. But they're saying, send us stones to punish us. So Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ Allah will not punish them whilst you are in their midst. Subhanallah. Allah will not punish them whilst you are in their midst, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the message is still fresh. It's carrying on. There will still be people who are going to turn. We're not going to destroy all of them. Subhanallah. And the verses continue. So these are just some of the verses that had been made, made mention of at that particular time, what was going on. Then the persecution continued and it continued more and more so much so that the Prophet ﷺ gathered those who had believed and told them, you know what? I allow you now to leave Mecca if you would like. Go to Habasha, which is Abyssinia. You will find a man there, the Negus of Abyssinia. His name was Ashama and he is a just ruler. He will not punish you. He will be very just. He will look after you, explain to him what has happened and proceed. So because of the persecutions, a group from amongst them proceeded. The first group who left Mecca because of persecutions. Imagine those who left Mecca the first time, none of them were slaves. They were all from top families. They were all people who were children of wealthy, influential people in Quraysh. And they decided to go them and their wives at times because they were not babies, but they were adults. And at the same time, children of people who were leaders. So. There were 10 men according to the most correct narrations, although some take it to 12. And four men according to the most correct narration, some people say five. Whatever it was, it's a similar figure. They had left and it is reported Ibn Hisham makes mention of the fact that Uthman ibn Mar'un was made their leader. They left towards the sea and Quraysh began their journey behind them. They sent some people, go and track these people down. But Quraysh did not manage to even go anywhere near before they could get there. These people were on their boat and they were on the way. And they had arrived then in Abyssinia and they remained there for a little period of time. From amongst them was Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anh. And from amongst them was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anh. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. So they had gone. When they went here in Makkah to Al-Mukarramah, something very, very powerful happened. What happened? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one day was near the Kaaba. And one narration says close to Safa. So being close to Safa, which is also not too far from the Kaaba, he was worshipping Allah and Abu Jahl came to him and beat him up and swore him. And now, as I told you, family members would always stand up. At that time, no one really noticed. But Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was out hunting. When he got back from his journey from hunting, someone told him, do you know what Abu Jahl did to your nephew? Gave him a good hiding. He, he made him bleed according to one narration. And another narration says he swore him. Whatever it was, he was abused. So Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib went with his bow and arrow and he struck Abu Jahl. And he says, Atashtumuhu wa ana ala dinihi aqulu ma yaqul. That was a powerful statement. The people were shocked. They used to sit around the Kaaba waiting and listening and talking. They had little groups and cliques that they used to sit around. And they heard Hamza saying, Are you abusing this nephew of mine? When I follow his religion and I say exactly what he says, Subhanallah. That was the first declaration of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. The Muslims became so happy. They were so happy because he was a powerful man. And this was a victory. So look, one of the victories granted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after the occasion of the abuse of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Abu Jahl, who was one of the arch enemies of Islam. This is why we always say, Rubba daratin nafi'ah. Today we read a verse. وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ They plot and Allah plans and plots and Allah is the best of planners and plotters. You will never ever be able to plot against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He always wins. So now what has happened? Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, he used to start, meaning he went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and started learning the religion. 
let's listen very carefully he started learning this religion and they used to gather in the house of al-arqam ibn abi al-arqam who was a makhzumi and the clan of makhzum they had a bit of a problem with these banu hashim they had a bit of a problem with these people and what they did is they had set the flag of war at one stage against them. So Banu Hashim was a little bit worried whenever it came to Banu Makhzum. And they would never ever imagine that a person from Banu Makhzum who was only in his teens would have accepted this faith and opened his doors for them to come in. They quietly used to go to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam, very silently learn this religion. For your information, to this day, there are some countries where Muslims are persecuted. They cannot learn their deen unless they do so privately. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Some of these Muslim, some of these countries are ruled by Muslims or so-called Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So this was happening at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam realized that this is the power of Allah. We are starting to grow in number. And he made a dua. He says, Allahumma a'izzal islam bi ahadil umarain. O oh Allah, grant strength to Islam by the acceptance of Islam of some of these powerful people. One of the two Umars, one known as Umar ibn al-Khattab, the other one known as Amr ibn Hisham, the enemy of Allah. Imagine, he had just abused Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and now the hands are coming up to say, O oh Allah, this man is so strong, if this energy and this strength was used in the right direction, it would come to so much good use. But because it is being used in the bad direction, look at the quality of leadership. A leader is he who looks at his enemies and sees the power of the enemies and thinks to himself, if we can get all this power to be used on our side, we perhaps would become a force to be reckoned with. Subhanallah. This was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, oh Allah, if that man who is doing so much harm is so powerful, they fear him. If he can come into Islam, imagine what would happen. So many people would accept Islam. Sometimes my brothers and sisters, Allah has put you in a position that if you start dressing properly, another 30, 40 people start dressing properly. They're watching you. You're like the role model, you know, the queen of teens. Allah protect us. They're all watching you. You wear this, they wear that. You wear that, they wear this. So why don't we seize this opportunity? Abu Jahl did not, and Abu Jahl would not. But when it came to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, listen to what happened. He came out one morning, he was fed up. Every day I'm hearing the same story. This man causing problems, he's swearing our gods, he's saying don't worship the idols. He wants to divert us from the religion of our forefathers. How can I allow this to continue? I'm a strong man. I am ibn al-Khattab. Let me go out and finish him once and for all. He had similar thinking to that of Abu Jahl, but they feared him because he was much more powerful in terms of physical strength. Umar ibn al-Khattab was a solid man. No one dared tread his path, cross his path. So as he came out with his sword and you could see the intent, when a man comes out of his home, it was not so big. It was a small area, but he walked out of his home with his sword and he was met by one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Where are you going? He says, I am going to sort Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam out. I want to kill him off. That's it. Finish. We won't have a problem after today in Quraysh. The problem will be sorted. So this man thought to himself, let me give this man a piece of advice. You want to start there. Start with your family. Do you know your sister Fatima bint al-Khattab? She has accepted Islam. She is following him. Why don't you start with her? He says, good idea. And he started walking in the direction of his brother-in-law's place. Saeed ibn Zubayr. Saeed ibn Zayd was married to his sister Fatima bint al-Khattab and he knocks on the door they had in according to one narration they were learning some Quran from a little parchment that they had had because as we know there was no paper at the time but they used to write on skins and little logs and little pieces of wood and parchments and so on and they had a little bit of this they were learning it according to one narration Khabbab ibn al-Arat was teaching them and what happened is they were indoors. They heard this bang on the door. They immediately hit Khabbab. Go and hide. You're not supposed to be here. What are you doing here? And when they opened the door, they hit those pages as well. He came in and started beating them up. Immediately. Started beating them. How can you accept Muhammad? You must disbelieve in Muhammad. You must this. You are that. You are traitors. You are tyrants. You have disgraced us. You are people like this and like that. My own family. And he beating, beating. And suddenly his sister began to bleed. When that blood came on the hands of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, 
Something clicked. This is my sister, man. I'm supposed to be looking after her. Here's her blood. How can this have happened? He says, okay, you know what? Pause for a moment. What were you people doing? I want to know. So they were trying to avoid the question and so on. And after his insistence, they said, okay, we were learning a few words from what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had brought. Now there was a rumor in Makkah to say that Muhammad has come with a religion where so many rules and regulations. He's telling you that women need to be dressed appropriately and you should respect your women. You cannot inherit women. They must be given inheritance. You need to do this. You need to do that. You are not allowed to do this, not allowed to do that. So many rules and regulations. So it just makes life difficult. Islam is a religion that just makes life difficult. Up to today, there are Muslims who think that Islam has too many rules and regulations. So that's why it's, it's difficult. It's not difficult. Listen to why Allah has done that. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was one of those who knew that rumor. And he looks at his sister. I want to see those pages. They said, look, you want to see what it is? You first need to cleanse. They made him cleanse and they took out these pages. Do you know what? A man who came out to kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw these pages. He read not more than four verses began to cry. What were these verses? The opening verses of Surah Taha. Taha ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an litashqa illa tazkiratan liman yakhsha tanzilan mimman khalaqa al-arda wa al-samawati al-ula knows the meaning of those two letters indeed your Lord has not revealed the Quran to you for it to be a source of your distress it is only but a reminder for those who are truthful for those who are humble for those who are fearful for those who have khashia in them for those who have that sense of God consciousness in them it is a revelation from the one who created the skies and the earth Umar ibn al-Khattab was moved already. He's never seen verses of this. It had the answer to a question that he had at the back of his mind. And at the same time, his sister is there. These are pure verses. He senses the purity. Take me to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want to go to him. You want to go to him? Well, they notice now, softened heart. Immediately they took him to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as he walked, he was told to follow. He followed. And they went out to whose house? Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam radiallahu anhu. One of these makhzoom boys. And who was in the house? Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was a senior person at the time. He was in this house as the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the most powerful up to that time. So when this man came to the door and the people saw that this man has come to the door of the house of Al-Arqam, Ibn Abi Al-Arqam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is inside. They knew he had made the dua that, oh Allah, strengthen Islam. And they knew there's nothing impossible here. But they were worried. So Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib says, let him in. Hada Umar. In yuridillahu bihi khayran, yuslim. Wa in yakun ghayra dhalika, yakun qatluhu alayna hayyinan. This is Umar. Let him come in. If he intends goodness, if Allah intends goodness from him, he will accept Islam. And if this man intends any harm, Ya Allah, make it easy for us to overcome him. We can overcome him with his own sword. He had his sword. And as he came in, it is reported that the Prophet wasallam held his clothing and held it and says, Ya Umar, what brings you here? He says, Jitu ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I have come to bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah and that you are indeed the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. When they heard the messenger saying Allahu Akbar, they knew that Umar ibn al-Khattab had entered the fold of Islam. They all began to say Allahu Akbar. I have a point I want to raise here. Umar ibn al-Khattab was an enemy of Islam. He read a few verses of the Quran which changed his life. We are Muslims. We read the Quran cover to cover, khatma after khatma, and still it has not moved us. Why? What is the problem? Allah, what is the problem? Where are our hearts? One, two verses moved people who were mountains in enmity and made them mountains of love. 
We, what has happened to us? We are Muslim. Come on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala move us. We know and I know of kuffar, disbelievers who have read the Quran and turned to Islam. And we know of Muslims who read the Quran but still don't turn to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah forgive our shortcomings. May He protect us from hypocrisy. May He give us a turning point. So this was the Islam of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Rumors spread. Do you know what happened? One narration says Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu asks, who is the person in Quraysh who spreads rumors the fastest? Allahu Akbar. Imagine how brave this man is. Others didn't want to know, didn't want the people to know they accepted Islam. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu comes and says, who is the man in Quraysh who has a name of spreading gossip like wildfire? They gave him a name. Do you want to know the name? Jamil ibn Ma'mar al-Jumahi. They say that man. So he went to Jamil, he tells him, you know what? I have accepted Islam and I am a Muslim. Jamil started running, running where? He ran to the Kaaba. He stood on top, right in one of the hillocks. He says, hey, Ibn al-Khattab has accepted Islam. He has renamed from the religion of our forefathers. And everyone was shocked. That's what Umar wanted. And on this side, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to one narration, he was the 40th person to accept Islam, according to one narration. And perhaps the 40th man, Allah knows best. He says, O Messenger, alasna ala al-haq, aren't we on the right path? He says, yes, we are. He says, okay, let's get up and we will read our salah from today in the haram in a group. Why must we duck and dive and go to someone's house and then we go to the Kaaba or singularly and we want to go to this place and the outskirts? Let's go. Allahu Akbar. When the Prophet made the dua, Ya Allah, strengthen Islam through the acceptance of Islam of one of these two people, the man came into the fold within moments, within a short space of time. It is reported few days after Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu this happened. And when he came, look at the strength. What happened? They made two lines of people, 20 in this line, 20 in the other. According to some narrations, perhaps the figure might not be that accurate, but Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was standing at the front of one of them and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, the front of the other. They marched on to the Kaaba. The Kaaba. They went into this haram. And remember that time it wasn't what it is today. It was just a Kaaba and a little vicinity around. They used to sit around. Quraysh used to sit in little groups. They used to talk and they used to chat. This is why it's an insult for us to come to the house of Allah and have little groups inside or outside and chat. That's wrong. You come to the house of Allah not to chat. You come in order to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's about time we learned that. Yes, if you have something to say out of respect. But the kuffar of Quraysh used to use the vicinity of the Kaaba to sit and chat and to boast and to brag about what happened this day and that day and sit and drink alcohol. We sit outside the masjid and smoke cigarettes. That's what happens. And we sit and chat up to late at night and we were the ones who were complaining about two minutes early that Taraweeh did not finish. So that's why now we're sitting outside for 20 minutes. Allah protect us. Where is our brains gone sometimes? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. May He grant us a lesson from these mushriks of Mecca. And may he open really the doors of mercy upon us and the doors of understanding. So these people were sitting. They witnessed Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu walk. They were looking at each other. They can't say anything. No words to utter. They seen Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. Rumor began to do its rounds. Soon news got to Habasha. News got to Abyssinia. That hey, the Muslims have accepted. Meaning the people of Quraysh are starting to accept Islam. So these people started returning from Abyssinia. Three months, they had just gone in. This was the first hijrah, the first migration to Abyssinia. Within three months, they began to come back because they heard this rumor that Quraysh started accepting Islam. How did they hear it? They heard it because of the acceptance of some of these strong people. And they had gone because of persecution. Who wants to spend time away from their families, away from where they grew up, away from the, where they were born and so on? Subhanallah. So when they came back, they noticed they were not allowed to enter Mecca except one of two conditions. Either quietly hiding, they came in, no one knew. Or someone had to come and lay a guarantee. And this was common at the time of Rasulullah even the pre-Islamic era, the guarantee. How it, how it was is a strong man from the people of Quraysh would guarantee that, look, this man, let him come in on my guarantee. No harm do you. Uh, meaning you should not harm him and he will not engage in X, Y, and Z. And that was like a guarantee. So some of them entered in that way and some of them came quietly. 
But something else happened. These mushriks of Quraysh, they decided we need to fix the Muslims. They're starting to become so powerful. So they decided to go to the Jewish clans around, some of the Jewish people, and ask them, how do we deal with this man? So they said, very simple, if you want to know whether he is a prophet or not, you ask him three questions. If he can answer you, he's a prophet. If he cannot answer you, he's not a prophet. What are the three questions? They say, the first, ask him about some youth of a long time ago. What a question. Someone comes to you, tell me about some youth of a long time ago. Second question, ask him about a man who went, who traveled from the east to the west and he was powerful. A man of a long time ago. Ask him. What type of a question? The third question, ask him about the soul and how it works. So the Quraysh were excited. They thought this man is never going to come with an answer. They told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have three questions for you. You answer them, we accept. You don't answer them, don't accept. What are the questions? So when they said the questions, he said, I will give you the response tomorrow. And he went back waiting for revelation. Revelation did not come. They came, what happened? He said, tomorrow, revelation did not come. Tomorrow, revelation did not come. Fifteen days went by and Quraysh came to him and told him, what is it? Fifteen days have gone by, you haven't yet come. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was saddened. He was making dua to Allah, Ya Allah, send me revelation with the response. And 15 days later, the revelation came down. Why did it delay? Simple reason. Because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not say, Inshallah. So Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Don't ever say you are going to do something tomorrow without adding the statement if Allah wills with it. So if you say I'm going to do this tomorrow, say inshallah, which means if Allah wills. As they say, God willing in the English language, we say if Allah wills, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that lesson. So when revelation came, the response of all three questions came. One was Surah Al-Kahf, the whole surah named after the people of the cave. Those were the youth of a long time ago. The seven of them, according to some narrations. And Allah makes mention of it in Surah Al-Kahf. إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدًا They were the youth who believed in their Rabb and we increased them in guidance. And Allah gives the story, beautiful story, Surah Al-Kahf. We mentioned it last year when we spoke of the stories of the prophets and when we spoke of the sleeper caves and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. Secondly, the man who traveled from the east to the west, the powerful man, he was Dhul Qarnayn. Also in Surah Al-Kahf towards the end, where Allah makes mention of Dhul Qarnayn. He traveled from here to there. This is what he did. This is what happened. He had a meeting with Ya'juj and Ma'juj where he entrapped them and so on. So all this was made mention of Quraysh was gobsmacked. The third question. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا They are asking you about the soul and how it operates. Tell them the soul is by the instruction of Allah and He has not given you knowledge except but a little. That is exactly what the Jewish people found in their books in terms of a response when it came to the soul. So they knew this man is a messenger. Still, they did not accept. And the people of Quraysh, they still did not accept. Look at this. They are asking questions. When the questions are answered, they still don't want to take it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from those who break our promises. Now the kuffar of Makkah were left with one option. They went to Abu Talib. They said, Abu Talib, now it's too much. We need your nephew. You need to stop protecting him. And this guarantee of yours, you need to withdraw it. We are making you the following offer. We can give you blood money of how many people you want, not just one. Give him to us, we execute him. He said, no, I'm not interested. Imagine blood money is always one for one. They said, we give you how many you like. 
Say it. You want blood money of 10 people, we give you. But give us one, this one man. He said, no. Then they said, okay, we make you another offer. Take any one of our children from the highest of families. Give us your nephew. You can keep that child and give him to us. He says, are you people mad? Are you crazy? You want me to take one of your sons to look after him so he can grow nicely? And you want to take my nephew in order to kill him? Doesn't make sense. Not at all. Foolish. He says, I'm not going to agree with that. So then they said, okay, we're not going to have any luck with this Abu Talib. Now they gathered. They gathered around and they decided amongst the tribes, let us sign a document. We must sign a document as unlettered as they were. They decided to put pen on paper. In the sense, they decided to write something. What did they write? They drew up a treaty to say, these families of Banu Muttalib and Banu Hashim, who are Muslim, we are going to expel them from our cities, meaning from our little suburb that we are living in right now, this part of Mecca, they can go out into the outskirts and we will not deal with them. We will not buy from them and we will not sell to them. We will not marry in them and we will not allow them to marry in us. And we will not provide them anything and we won't accept anything from them. We will never sign treaties with them and we don't want them to sign anything with us. We will not mix with them and we don't want them to mix with us. We will not sit with them and we don't want them to sit with us. We will not talk to them and we don't want them to talk to us. We will not enter their houses and we don't want them to enter our houses. Complete sanctions. Imagine. Against who? Against believers. People who believed in one Allah. People who had the direct help of the Almighty. But this was all the plan of the Almighty. Later on, the Muslims always speak about how these days were. There were people who hated Islam at that particular time, who accepted it later on. And they say, how foolish we were at that time. How Allah blessed us to hold us a little bit. Had Allah punished us whilst we were still in that time, we perhaps would have never ever believed. Now it's us and our offspring and children and children's children. May Allah grant us steadfastness. So this thing, they wrote it. And what did they do? They hung it in the Kaaba, inside the Kaaba. They hung it and everyone abided by it. So no one spoke to these people. And what happened? Because they used to take Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the outskirts in order to protect him from being killed by the people of Quraysh. Because had he been killed by the people of Quraysh, there would have been massive disaster there. There would have been an outbreak of war. So the Muslims and Abu Talib, and some of the family members of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they used to ensure that he sleeps in a certain place where nobody would be able to reach him. So what they did, the people of Quraysh, they decided, right, you're staying there, you're not coming here. The Muslims were surrounded. They weren't allowed to come out. No one was allowed to go in with food, with any form of goodness. The one who was exempt from this, although he belonged to the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Abu Lahab because he was an enemy. He was one of those who used to go around telling the people, watch out, don't even give them food. What happened? They had their provisions, their food depleted. When it depleted, one year passed. One year passed, what happened? Another year passed. There was no food. No one gave them food, no one dealt with them, nothing happened. Wallahi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to eat leaves of the tree together with his companions and together with some who were not even Muslim who happened to be there because it was their family a few and no one battered an eyelid from Quraysh they watching these people suffering so much so that they began to cook the skins or roast the skins of the animals they had eaten up all their animals roasting the skins of their animals and chewing on this, the inside of that skin, Allahu Akbar, to try and extract whatever goodness they could have had. And sucking on the roots of some of these shrubs that were there in the desert in order to get water. They had suffered for three years in what was known as Shia bi Abi Talib. The name of this place, like a valley, just in the outskirts of where these people were, where the Muslims were now surrounded. And what had happened? Allahu Akbar, 
Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed his companions, instructed them, you can now go to Habasha, go back to Abyssinia. You can go back to Abyssinia. Inshallah, Allah will grant you a place there. Allah will grant you safety. There is a ruler there who is just. He is an African ruler who is a Christian man who is just. He will not oppress you. He will treat you well and he will welcome you and he will look after you. His name is Ashama. He is the Negus of Abyssinia where Ethiopia is today. So it is reported that the second batch of people silently left. And this time it was more difficult to leave. From amongst them, it is reported there were 83 men. If we count Ammar ibn Yasir, 83. And if we don't count him, 82. There is a difference of opinion as to whether he went or did not go. And 18 women, they had left. And the Amir or the person who was made their leader was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And they had gone, they arrived in Abyssinia. Meanwhile, the Muslims are suffering in this sanctioned area where they were completely surrounded. Nothing goes in, nothing comes out. No one talks to them, nothing happens. So when Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu got with his group of men and women to Najashi in Africa, this was the first place that Islam got a base besides Arabia. Before Medina, already Islam had arrived in Africa. Subhanallah. Islam had arrived in Africa first before everywhere else. And this was just a few years in, approximately five years after the prophethood. Five years after the prophethood, it already arrived in Africa. And Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu tells Najashi, we are people, we've been oppressed, we have uh, a Nabi amongst us, a messenger who has come with the word of Allah. He has instructed us to do this, to do that, to stop worshipping idols, to stop oppressing our women, to stop cheating and deceiving, to look after our neighbors, to honor our treaties and to fulfill our promises. And he has instructed us to pray and to, to fast and to give alms to the poor and so on. And he has done this and that. And our people began to persecute us. They wanted us to go back to the religion of our forefathers. They want us. We were a nation who used to bury our daughters alive. We were a nation who used to engage in so much mockery of our own women folk. We used to buy and sell and trade in human beings. And we used to do this and that and so many different things. And we used to worship idols completely until Allah sent in our midst a messenger who came with a book. And he came with revelation. Revelation. And he instructed us to do this and this. Najashi here. And he told him, you are welcome in this land. And you will be protected here. And you may worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But hang on. The people of Quraysh. They had already sent their men. Amr ibn al-As. He was sent with Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah. And some narrations make mention of. Amara ibn al-Walid. They were sent to Najashi as well. They got to Najashi. They said, wait, these people are traitors. We are here in order to get back certain young people who have ran away. And they, they are being sought after in Quraysh. And our people have sent us here. And we come here to trade a lot. And we need these people back because they have been swearing our gods. And they have turned away from the religion of our forefathers. And, and, and. And Najashi was so upset, so upset very angry because they had brought him gifts they gave him lots of gifts they were wealthy people Quraysh they brought him gifts and so on and he heard from Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and he says these people are correct they will stay here and you will not be able to do anything you need to return the following morning these two decided let's try and strike a chord so they go to Najashi in the morning and they say you know what they say about Jesus, may peace be upon him. Isa. They know this man is a Christian. So they say, these people blaspheme Jesus. So Najashi calls Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. He says, what do you say about Jesus? He says, we say whatever Allah has instructed us. Whatever our messenger has instructed us. We say that he was the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted to the Virgin Mary. And he was born without a father. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him life. He spoke to people when he was a baby. And 
he declared that he is Abdullah wa Rasuluhu. He is none other than a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophet of his. And that's what we say. And we stop there. So Najashi looks and he says, read me some verses from what you have. So they started reading the verses, Kaf, Haya, Ayn, Sad. Allahu Akbar. ذكر رحمة ربك عبده زكريا إذ نادى ربه نداء خفيا نجاشي just like عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه began to cry so much so that verses were revealed telling محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم that they are people who are leaders of the Christians who when they heard the Quran they began to weep وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ When they heard the verses of the Quran being read, their eyes became filled with tears. The tears began to roll down because of what they knew was the truth. And they said, Oh, our Rabb, we believe, so write us from amongst those who have borne witness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. Inshallah, tomorrow we will go through what happened at this particular time with Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and with Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. And by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will get to see the victory of the Muslims and what had happened. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness until we meet again. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.